Welcome, I'm John Caldera, president of the Independence Institute and your devil's advocate. A little later on, the power of podcasts. But first, you know them, you love them. Yeah, you just love them. Dave Kopel from the Independence Institute. Glad to, glad to see you. Thank you very much. All right, you've been working on a project now for 15 years, and you and I have talked about this, and I'm, I'm thrilled that the morality of self-defense and military action is actually turning, in, turning into a, a, a project or a, a book. Yes. All right. Uh, Very long gestation. It is. <laughs> so let me, let me just ask you about this. Even before I got the gig at Independence, even before um, you and I got to know each other, I read your work on Second Amendment issues. I uh, read your work on, on self-defense issues. And it was always kind of this give and take because I always felt that there was this tension between you know, this Christian feeling of pacifism, this feeling of, well, wait a second, Good God-fearing people are not the ones who pack guns. Uh, and you've always had this argument, well, yes, the Bible's pretty clear about this stuff. And it's, it's always been a theme of yours. You finally put it in the book. What, what was the question you're trying to answer? Is it moral to use force in the, in the Judeo-Christian tradition? To use force to defend yourself, to defend your family, to defend your community? to defend your nation, such as by serving in an army, and probably what's been the toughest question for philosophers to use force uh, to protect your community by overthrowing a tyrant. Throughout history, God is always on the side of your army. It doesn't matter what army you are on, God wants you to win. Um, so how can both sides of, of a fight claim God? Exactly the question that Abraham Lincoln asked at his, uh, in his second inaugural, pointing out that, that on both sides of the Civil War, each of them thought that uh, they prayed to the same God. Um, it, it can't be right, uh, but that doesn't mean that God is always neutral in every conflict. Um, I think God had a point of view in, in favor, I don't know, but it seems likely, uh, based on all the other evidence that God favored uh, the defeat of uh, the Nazis in World War II. You think so? Yes. You think you really cared? If there's a real God who is active in human events, yeah, the, that would seem to be one of the, the classic things to care about. All right, let's bring it to a real personal level first. The book says, turn the other cheek. Now, I always thought that was something about mooning, but then when <laughs> I went to Catholic school, they said, no, 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 they're talking about when somebody hits you, you don't take an action, you turn the other cheek. That is, Jesus taught, it seems to me, pacifism. If, if the good book says, turn the other cheek, how can you arm yourself and not turn your, other, turn your cheek? Uh, because it's from the Sermon on the Mount, and you, uh, that needs to be read like any other passage in the Bible in the, the context of, of the Bible as a whole. So one of the other things Jesus said was carry a sword. In fact, that was his last instruction to his disciples. At the Last Supper, uh, he said, everybody, I've been, basically I've been taking care of all your, your needs up to this point, but now you're gonna have to be more responsible about that. So, you know, get a knapsack so you can carry stuff around. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. And immediately, two of the disciples whip out what apparently were concealed short swords and say, <laughs> Lord, here, we are, here, here, here they are, we have two. And then, then Jesus says, that's enough. So for 11 guys, two swords was enough, which I guess means you don't have to, you know, they, they didn't need to have a... Not everybody, you know, not everybody needs to be packing heat. So you're, you're telling yeah. me that, that a tenth of the uh, apostles are packing heat. Two elevenths, yeah, yeah. Um, which was illegal. Uh, the Roman law of the time was the death penalty for a Jew uh, who carried a sword. Now, one of those Jews was Matthew, who was a tax collector, so maybe he was exempt. Uh, but the other one was, was Peter, who was not a government official, and it was plainly illegal for him to carry. All right, so get back to the Sermon on the Mount, though. Yeah. All right. Because the idea, at least what I perceive of Christianity, is that of forgiveness and, oh, how to put it, um, almost pacifism. That, you know, that we win not by fighting, we win by refusing to fight. Yes, and that, that what you said is a good summary of a lot of, of you that many early Christians had, many others did not. But that's exactly a, a, a side of, of the argument of Christianity that's been going on almost from the beginning. 
And there, there's always been two sides of that, and people can pick and choose the, the scriptures they want to look at. I think the, the, the stronger argument is the Sermon on the Mount was, not, was meant to be taken seriously, but not literally. So in, in that same sermon, Jesus also said, resist not evil. So if you're going to take that literally, well, that means, you know, you're, you can... Resist not, not evil? Shouldn't you resist evil instead of re <laughs> resisting not evil? I think it was, it's typically meant in the sense of don't resist evil, which is obviously something that, that could be true and might be appropriate in some context, but isn't a universal rule. Or Jesus also said, if somebody asks you to go one mile, go the extra mile. Now, the social context of that was, if you're a Roman soldier, you could order one of your colonial peoples, like a Jew, you're leaving town, you must carry my pack, my military equipment, one mile. And Jesus says, well, and they had to do it, no choice on that. And what he's saying is, you, you as this oppressed people, you can actually, by your own choice, uh, re reclaim some power by making a choice to do more. So when the Roman soldier tells you, carry my pack one mile, you say, fine, I'm going to carry it two miles, showing your uh, generous spirit. When he's talking about... Um, but you're just serving your oppressor. Well, and the, that's Jesus' point, is sometimes you, the, there's a lot of judo in, in Christianity of, of taking the other side's strength and your weakness and, and flipping them, and the, go the extra mile is, is that. But if you tried to take that uh, principle and apply it too literally, well, then it's, well, when the army conscripts you and says, serve one year, you say, no, I'm going to serve two. And maybe you could apply that principle that way, but it's certainly not a pacifist principle. Turn the other cheek. A slap on the cheek is a very serious insult in the culture of the time. It's not a deadly assault. It's not a deadly assault. No, it's, it's, it, it's an insult. It, it's a, and when you get into the details, it would have been a, a, a left-hand slap <clears throat> which is from the slapper's toilet hand. So it was a really major insult. But there's a difference between how you re react to an insult versus how you react to somebody trying to what kill about, you. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm pulling things sure. scattershot here. You know, give unto God what is God's, give unto Caesar what is Caesar. So the idea is, you know, um, how, how does that jive with your thoughts that it is Christian, it is, okay to resist oppression when the big man says give Caesar what Caesar's exactly so that would that's another thing that shows that the, the turn the other cheek thing doesn't have to be interpreted in a pacifist way render under Caesar what is Caesar's means pay your taxes in the Roman coinage which has a little picture of Caesar on it and as everybody well knew the <coughs> what Roman taxation was overwhelmingly for was paying to support the army. So today when a Christian says, well, I don't want to pay taxes because some of it will go to support the military and not only am I a pacifist, but I won't have anything to do e even by paying general taxes uh, with something that's going to support the army, the render unto Caesar thing would, would seem to go the other way, which is be a regular citizen and, and pay your appropriate taxes knowing that they're going for the military. First part of your book has to do with the Old Testament. Now I can see the Old Testament being, the Old Testament God being very pro, pro gun. I could see him being very <laughs> pro sword. He he was a mean son of a bitch compared to the New Testament God. What what is the difference between the two books when it comes to the idea of self defense and uh, defending your nation? As you say, the, the Old Testament is is crystal clear, and that's why in in, in Jewish tradition. There really hasn't been much of a pacifist tradition. Now, you know, Jews can think any, anything they want. There's a saying that there's 640,000 ways of interpreting the Torah, one for each Jew who marched through uh, the Red Sea when the waters were parted. So y you can have all kinds of interpretations, but to the extent you're sticking with the text and the interpretations and things like the Talmud and, and all the commentary, there has never been any serious Jewish pacifist tradition. Sometimes Jews have acted like pacifists out of uh, sort of common sense survival in the diaspora. Uh, if, if they were living in some city in, in Germany and the, the Gentiles were oppressing them, well, if they started resisting uh, forcefully, they weren't going to win that scenario. So it was better just to kind of let them push you around for a while and, and hope they go away. Uh, and then 
Zionism is very much about the recovery of Jewish self-defense, not only in theory, which always existed, but actually putting it into practice, and the Jews having their own land, the place where the Jewish body could be physically rediscovered. So, you know, what's a Jew? Oh, it's this kind of very pale guy who gets beat up on the streets, but he, he knows all about the Talmud. And Zionism is, no, hey, great to know all about the Talmud, but you want to be a healthy guy who's outdoors, mountain climbing, a vigorous guy who can defend yourself, your family, and your people. And the culmination of that is uh, the Jewish resistance in World War II. Uh, they fought back at a rate far higher than any other occupied people and caused a lot of trouble for the Nazis where they were, saved many, many thousands of lives. And of course, that led, it led to the establishment of, of Israel, which was one created by force of arms against people who wanted to exterminate the Jews. I still have this image that if you're a Christian, if, if you're a peace-loving person, and somebody like the Quakers come to my mind, you know, uh, when they're conscripted, they go, sorry, put me in jail, I'm not gonna carry a gun because it's against my faith. I think most people still think that, that that's what a Christian, that's what a religious person is supposed to do when it comes to the idea of self-defense, self-determination, overthrowing oppressors, is that we do so by, I don't play. And I think that's the, um, the, we have a whole chapter on the Quakers in there, and I think they're really the, the high point of Christian pacifism. Because the, the previous Christian pacifists, they had their textual arguments, but I think that the Quakers recognized, look, you've got this textual argument, but you've got the other textual argument. The, the New Testament is, has enough stuff in it that, that both people can find things to say. And so the Quakers didn't really try to prove their point scripturally. What they said is they, they revolutionized Christianity in a sense because they said the big thing is not, it's not the church, it's not the structure, it's not the ritual, it's you and God one-on-one. -on -one. Just listen to that still small voice inside. And when you start listening to that, that still small voice will eventually make you a person who just couldn't be violent, who couldn't ever intentionally harm another person. And at that sense, it's irrefutable, because if, if you do listen to that inner voice and that's where you come out, well, th there's no scriptural or philosophical argument on the other side. And that's, so, so they're right for themselves. And one thing the early Quakers were also impressive about was the respect for the conscience of others. So, if, for example, in the Constitution of East Jersey, which was the, the four, the, one of the things that led to New Jersey when it became united with West Jersey. Very, very, a lot of Quaker settlement there. It said for our, it was written by Quakers and non-Quakers, and it said, we respect the conscience rights of people who don't want to fight, like Quakers, so we're not going to force them to be in the militia, and we equally respect the conscience rights of people who have the opposite conclusion. So our government is certainly going to have a militia and do self-defense and all those other things. The, the Quakers said you, you can't impose it on someone. It has to come from within. And that's the difference between the, the great Quakerism of people like William Penn versus sort of the modern political correctness of some pacifist aggressives who are not only pacifists in their own conscience. Pacifist aggressives? Yes. They, Can there be such a thing? They, oh, they are the core of the, the modern gun ban movement. They are people who not only have their personal conviction about pacifism, they want to impose their morality on everybody else. You know, maybe they listen to their still small voice, but it's, you are gonna listen, everybody else is gonna have to follow my conscience instead of their own. This book took 15 years for you to finally, which for a book for you, because you pop these out every other month it seems, but also, you, you compared it once to um, how long it took to get concealed carry. And in people's minds, the idea of, wait a second, you can't be a God-loving, peaceful person and own a gun, carry a gun, for your own defense and the defense of your family and to throw off a tyrant at some point. That these are just completely opposite. Yes, and, that's, and that is a good articulation of what's always been a respectable minority view in Christianity, but definitely not the majority view over time. And the great Christian philosophers, uh, Thomas Aquinas, uh, um, among many others, and the whole philosophy that eventually led to the American Revolution um, 
said the opposite, that Christianity is about caring for other people, it's about being responsible to and for other people, and so when your friends and, and when your neighbors or even strangers are under attack, you have a duty to use whatever resources you have to defend them. Congratulations on the book. I'm sure you're gonna get a lot of angry pacifists, but what are they gonna do, hit you? I don't <laughs> think so. Dave Kopel, thank you. Stay tuned.